Welcome to the American Monetary Association's podcast, where we explore how monetary policy impacts the real lives of real people and the action steps necessary to preserve wealth and enhance one's lifestyle. Welcome to the podcast for the American Monetary Association. This is your host, Jason Hartman, and this is a service of my private foundation, the Jason Hartman Foundation. Today, we have a great interview for you, so I think you'll enjoy it. And comment on our website or our blog post. We have a lot of resources there for you, and you can find that at AmericanMonetaryAssociation.org. That's AmericanMonetaryAssociation.org, or the website for the foundation, which is JasonHartmanFoundation.org. Thanks so much for listening, and please visit our website and enjoy our extensive blog and other resources there. It's my pleasure to welcome Diane Kennedy to the show. You may know her name in the real estate circles because she is a very well-known tax advisor. And when it comes to real estate, this is the expert. So it's great to have her on the show. Diane, welcome. Thank you, Jason. I'm glad to talk about real estate today. This is fun. Well, we want to hear all about it. We all know it's a fantastic investment. It's a way to really be in control of your financial future rather than leaving it to some crooked Wall Street investment banker or CEO or mutual fund manager. So I think the listeners are pretty convinced that real estate is the best investment in America today. But there are tax implications and mostly they benefit the real estate investor. I find that the tax laws are very favorable toward real estate. But what are some of the pitfalls and things that people want to watch out for to be a, a better investor and make sure they get all of their tax benefits? Well, you know, for years I talked about the fact that you could take real estate and create cash flow with it, money you're putting in your pocket, and yet perfectly legally show on the tax return a tax loss. It's a paper loss. In other words, it doesn't cost you any money to have that kind of a loss, but you still get this benefit of a tax write-off. Well, over the years, the IRS has made it tougher and tougher to take that loss. So where we are today, there's a couple of limitations on that now. For example, if you make less than $100,000 a year, you can take a loss of up to $25,000 against your other income. If you make over $150,000 a year, you can't take any of the loss. Between $100,000 and $150,000, the amount of the allowable loss phases out. There is a little trick to this, and the trick is something called a real estate professional status. Now, what I think happened is a lot of people got real excited with this, and there was some abuse of the system. Now, as a result, is the IRS is after it pretty hard these days. We're seeing a lot of audits. started about two years ago in California. And unfortunately, if you've got high other income and you're showing a real estate loss with real estate professional status, you might be getting the IRS knocking at your door. So this is one of those things, don't be afraid of taking the deduction, but if you do, just be prepared for an audit and make sure you've got all your I's dotted and your T's crossed and you'll be able to get through it without a problem. Okay, fantastic. I have to mention that Diane is coming to us from Baja, Mexico, and so the sound is a little bit strange at times. I think there's probably a satellite connection here on the phone. Just bear with us, listeners, and we'll try and improve that as much as possible in post-production. So that's with the real estate professional part of it. Tell us how the real estate professional law works, if you will, and then where the IRS is kind of picking at it, if you would. Sure. Um, the real estate professional status, what that means is, is that you set two criteria. One is spend more hours in real estate activities than you do any other business activity. And number two, you have at least 750 hours a year in that real estate activity. So in other words, if you've got another job, you're going to have to spend more hours in the real estate activities than you do your other job. Now, if you're working full-time, that might be pretty hard to prove. So they're going to want to see some kind of log to prove the hours you're working at your other job versus the hours in your real estate activity. If you don't work at all, then you have this minimum at least of 750 hours a year, which works out to about 15 hours a week. And if you've got a lot of property, that's not a hard one to, to meet. Okay, here's the trick what uh, the IRS is after. They're going to want to see a log of your hours that you spent in the real estate activities. And my suggestion is don't walk in there with 750 hours if that's what you need to meet. Instead, walk in there with at least 1,500. So if they throw some out, you've still got enough hours to be able to prove your case. 
some of the challenges that they're making right now are related to how active are you really. For example, sitting at your computer and looking through MLS, looking at properties, they're throwing that one out. They, they say that's passive. It's not really actively doing something. They want to see you out there. For example, we had a case, it was an interesting one. It was an IRS audit on the real estate professional status. The client was in California and he had property up in Washington. And he was claiming that he was active in the management of that property. Actually, it was construction and then management. And they absolutely didn't buy it, even though we had the logs to prove it all. They said, he, there's no way from California he's running something in Washington. Well, the client came up with a picture that showed him at the job site with a hard hat on. And for whatever reason, the auditor just loved that, and that was enough to win the audit. They said, okay, well, if he's showing up with a hard hat, obviously he's doing some work and he's active in it. So you, you never know. Take lots of pictures. Show that you're out there hammering your nail or picking up a board or meeting with somebody or putting the sign in the ground. Show that you're actively managing these properties. The second part of that is, is that then qualifies you for real estate professional status. The second part, though, is you have to materially participate in the management of these properties. In other words, you're actually involved in the properties. That means not just that you're spending hours as a real estate professional, but also specifically with the property. The rule here is you need to spend 500 hours or more per property. Now, if you've got 10 properties, you might have just now had a mock heart attack thinking, 5,000 hours, how am I going to do that? Well, the IRS lets you make an election. It's called an aggregation election. Make it on your return. When you do that, you say, I only have to meet the standard for one. In other words, all of these properties count as long as I get my 500 hours of material participation in the property. Usually that one's not so hard to do. It, you just have to prove that you were involved in something, meeting with the property manager, going out and inspecting the property, checking on background checks for uh, potential tenants, or inspecting to make sure the roof isn't leaking, whatever. As long as you're actively doing something with that property, or if you have multiple properties, in total, 500 hours a year. Okay, now, Diane, a lot of people that are listening happen to be in the real estate business. And when I say that, I just want to make a distinction here. They invest in real estate for their personal portfolio, and then they also might sell real estate either full-time or part-time, or they might be in some other part of the real estate business. They might be a mortgage rep. Like I mentioned before, they might be a real estate agent. And there's sort of this overlap issue there, and I think this applies to yours truly as well, where their business and their whole life is real estate, but that does not necessarily mean real estate professional, right? Yeah, it kind of does. So, Jason, maybe this will be good news for you. <laughs> the, um, the, you get to count the hours if you're involved in a real estate activity, like a real estate agent or a mortgage broker, that type of thing, as long as you own at least 5% of the company. So if you work for Caldwell Banker or somebody as a W-2 employee and you don't own any of Caldwell Banker, you don't get to count all the hours you're doing it. But if you're a sales agent where you get a Form 1099, in other words, you're an independent contractor, that means you have your own business. So those hours would count then. Okay. So that overlap can actually work to someone's benefit, but we also want listeners to know that if they are not in the real estate business and they are purely a real estate investor, it is possible for them to qualify as a quote-unquote real estate professional as well, right? It is. In fact, I have that frequently. Um, I have a client down in Florida where he's a full-time doctor, works a lot of hours as a cardiologist. His wife is a part-time nurse. They had a lot of property, and so what we did actually is had his wife cut down her hours in nursing so that it, we could get her to qualify as the real estate professional. They had a lot of properties, and it was true. She really was the one managing them, so that was an easy thing to prove. The interesting thing is, is that it then allowed her to really concentrate on the real estate, and she's ended up making a ton of money in real estate, especially now in this down market, picking up properties and leasing them out and getting positive cash flow, I think she's going to pass her husband's salary pretty soon. Yeah, that's, in, that's interesting. Okay, so is there anything else we should talk about as far as the real estate professional category goes? Well, you know, the other downside, and just kind of, it's kind of to think about this, is 
if you then have a property that goes bad, you have something that you need to, we call it dumping bad real estate. You do a loan modification, um, a short sale primarily is, is the issue. If you sell something and you actually have a loss, here's just a little note that if this is, anybody's in this spot, if you had previously aggregated your properties together, Remember I talked about that aggregation so you can get through that 500-hour deal. If you've previously aggregated, you need to de-aggregate, if that's a word, the properties before you sell. Otherwise, any loss stays in that group and you have to sell all the properties in order to take the loss. It gets suspended. Oh, so this is, this is it. Let me, let me just ask you for some clarification here, if I may. So what you're saying here is when someone becomes a real estate professional, they sort of notify the IRS of their intent to do this. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, you do that actually on your tax return. Yeah. There is a... That's an, an election, election that's made. right. Yep. And, but the, the challenge is, is that you need to do something in the year that, before you do a short sale, as an example, or you sell a property at a loss. Otherwise, you don't lose the loss. It's just it's suspended until you sell all the other properties. It's a funny little tax rule that you've got to be careful of. Okay, now I remember when my CPA did this. I don't remember it perfectly clearly, but it, it was something to the effect of it was just a little page attached to my return, and it says something along the lines of, taxpayer elects to treat all real estate as one activity or something like that? Boy, you've got it. You could come to work for my firm. That's well, it. I don't want to do taxes, okay? But <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> if things ever get tough in real estate, I'll give you a call. Um, okay. <laughs> but, but, but what that means is they're aggregating this. Uh, explain that to the listeners, if you would. And then, and then explain the disaggregation because... That's how they get the benefit of the loss if they have to dump something, right? Exactly, yeah. So when you make this election, if you don't, let's, let's talk about the downside. What if you don't make this election? Well, you're, remember that 500 hours per house of active participation or, or material participation I talked about. If you've got 10 properties and you've got to do 500 hours each, that's a lot of hours you're going to have to put in Instead, what you do is you say, we're going to call this all one activity, all these 10 properties. So we're electing to aggregate. In other words, combine them. And the only reason we're doing this is just for purposes, so we only have to meet one requirement of the 500 hours. Now, the problem is, is down the road, we've said this is all one activity. So if you have one activity and you sell off just a piece of it, you really haven't sold the activity yet. And until you sell it all, you don't get to take advantage of the loss. So you have to find, uh, you de-aggregate is the best way to put it, de-aggregate this one property you're going to sell out of there. So there's something that you do that's different. This is the kind of thing where you need to sit down with your CPA and strategize a little. How can we make this property different from the other properties and then be able to say, hey, we pulled it out first before we did anything else. Okay, and and the reason is is that they, they can... Explain the difference. You still get to take advantage of the tax loss, but it's different in the way it's calculated, right? Right, yeah. What, it, if you look at it this way, if you're making over $150,000 a year, you're not going to be able to take advantage of any real estate loss while you're holding the property unless you go through this method. So by doing the aggregation, you get to take advantage of current losses. But there's a little gotcha in this. If you stay in this aggregation and you sell, the loss itself for the sale becomes suspended. You have to sell all the other properties to get it, take advantage of it. And you don't want the loss suspended because... No, you, no, you want to take advantage you want of to it. Take it right one away. of the rules is you take every expense and every loss you can immediately. That's one of the tax rules. Right. Defer mm -hmm. your taxes as long as you can. Sure. Hopefully to never. Well, now, now I do have to say, let me just make a little comment on that if I could right now. I met with my investment banker last week, and he said that business is actually quite good. He buys and sells companies, and I was talking to him about a possible acquisition, and he said business is quite good because people are selling their companies now in anticipation of much higher taxes under the Obama regime. So sometimes, does it ever make sense to pay a tax early? No. no? You don't you like that what? idea. Okay. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And it, yeah, that's an interesting comment. So I said that and I thought, ah, oh, well, maybe not. Uh, and the reason is just simply because we've got capital gains going up next year, mm -hmm. the, the capital gains dividend. And if we want to get really concerned about it, it's going from 15 to 20 percent on the cap. Additionally, the Senate proposal for the new health care bill 
one of the ways they're talking about making it, paying for it, is to further increase the capital gains tax. So we're potentially looking at a 69% increase in the capital gains tax. That's a lot. I'm so glad you put it that way because so many people do not understand this very simple thing when it comes to taxes. In California here, I, I'm in the People's Republic of California, and <laughs> I, I say that with all due affection, uh, sarcastically, of course. When our sales tax went up, people thought, oh, it's just a one and a quarter percent increase, or it was different depending on what city in which you live. And Really, it was a much higher increase. It was like a 17% increase in tax. But people th think, well, it's just one and a quarter percent or something. This is much more significant. And you said that correctly. You said that's a 69% increase in capital gains tax. So I, I thank you for saying it that way. That was the proper way to point it out. Well, yeah, and it, it adds up. I mean, that's the other part of it. When, you know, I have clients that maybe are in businesses where their margin is you know, 3 to 5% to the bottom line. In other words, there's things that there's a lot of cost in, they have a lot of volume. But you start playing with numbers and you're only making 3 to 5% on every dollar you make. It, it doesn't take very long for you're out of, until you're out of business. So that's a concern. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. Okay, go on, though, with what you were saying. Okay, so back on the real estate. The point with the aggregation is it lets you take a current expense, you get to take advantage of that loss in your tax return. But when you sell it down the road, unless you unwind what you've done, it's going to suspend that loss. So if you unwind it, though, do you lose all the benefits of being a real estate professional in that year? No, no. You, you just for that one property, which oh, is selling anyway, okay. so you don't care about. Okay, got it. Okay, so that's good. We leave everything else alone. Okay, so we touched on, we really talked about the real estate professional. We talked about selling it on how? A short sale or a foreclosure or how are they dumping this property? Yeah, you know, it, it, in this case, if you're selling it and you've got that loss, that's where it is. So a short sale or just even just a regular sale that you're selling at a loss. If you've got a loss, you, need to, you want to be able to take it. You know, maybe I could just give you an example of this is the nightmare that I'm afraid some people are going to wake up to who've been doing short sales and, or foreclosures. Let's say you bought a property for $200,000 and it's now worth $100,000. You're able to talk the bank into t to letting you do a short sale for 100000 so you think, okay, whew, I'm done with that, That's we're done. But let's say that it, what's happened is you've actually gotten income because there was a loan on this for $200,000. I'm just going to say that it was, you buy it $200,000, 100% cash, or 100% loan. So you've got $100,000 forgiveness that's happened. That's taxable income for you. Now, if this property was a real estate investment that you had, you also are going to have a loss when you sell that property. And so, in effect, you end up, they probably zero each other out, or you actually might even have a little bit of a loss to get a take on your property. So the fact that you just got hit with this 1099 showing taxable income because of the forgiveness doesn't matter. But it starts to get tricky if that property had been in this group and the loss gets suspended. All of a sudden, now you've got taxable income, and you can't take a loss against it. I'm afraid of that nightmare for a lot of people right now. Does that make sense? No, I'm not sure it does. Can you just do that one more time, maybe another one? Absolutely. So we've got a property, let's say um, you paid $200,000 for it, and it was all a loan of $200,000. Then the problem is the property is now worth just 100000 Okay. They're able to get the bank to accept the short sale of 100000 So they're writing off the other 100 And they're giving you a 1099 for the debt relief. Right. They're right. giving you a 1099 for that. That's taxable income to you. Okay. But, I mean, you're going to have to pay tax on $100,000. But the benefit you're going to get is that, or the offset is, you've got something with a basis of 200000 because that's what you paid for it, that you just sold for 100000 So there's another, there's a taxable income of 100000 but there's also loss of 100000 so it ends up zeroing each other out. Now, Diane, I have to ask you about this. Wasn't it Bush last year that said when all these short sales were occurring and people were getting this debt relief, that they didn't have to pay tax on that? Was that only on their personal residence and not investment Yeah, properties? I'm so glad okay. you asked yeah. that question. It was just the personal residence. Now, here's a little other thing to be aware of. It's only for federal tax. California ah, did not yeah. adopt it. Right. So for people who had that debt relief, first on their personal residence, 
they're still going to pay California tax on it. So, yeah, and that, that was the same with the go zone. When we were really active in the go zone, people were buying properties there. It doesn't get you out of the People's Republic of California. You still got to pay the franchise tax board. And, and in whatever state you're in, if they have a state tax, you have to pay state tax. Okay, so that's a good distinction. What else should people know? I think that the other, the part of this real estate when it comes to taxes, it's really important to be strategic and think about what is the end game we want here with the taxes. For example, if you're buying a lot of property and you're, you're picking up great cash flowing, uh, I have a friend who just bought two houses in Detroit for $500. I had to put about $10,000 into them, got them both rented right away. I mean, she's going to make money on that, without a doubt. So we need to look for all the, the write-offs we can get for that. The question then to look at is, if we create a big paper loss for her, is it something she can even use? Is she going to qualify as a real estate professional to be able to take it? If not, maybe it's not worth it to take go that extra step. Maybe we just want to zero out income. So be strategic in what you're thinking of with the real estate. It's possible to do some what's called front-end loading with your depreciation and end up in the first five to seven years creating huge paper losses on your real estate. If you can take advantage of them, that can be a great thing. But if you can't, you're just creating more of an audit risk and you're just going to suspend losses anyway. It doesn't make any sense. And I think that if you've got property that you've dumped through, uh, you've had to do short sales, foreclosures, deed in lieu of, or you've done loan modifications on them, before the end of the year, talk to your tax planner with this. Get, get, make sure you've got this planned for because there can be some tax consequences you haven't thought of. And it's not too late to do something about it as long as you do it before the end of the year. Okay, good to know. Now, one of the great things about real estate and income properties is that if people followed a good prudent strategy and they were using debt properly, you know, I don't say to abuse it, but it's a very powerful tool if you use it correctly. A lot of people are very fortunate and now, again, they're getting a whole nother bonus. They're getting loan modifications. And by the way, for our listeners, we have a little, I'll do a little shameless self-promotion here. We have a do-it-yourself loan modification kit that you can purchase at (laughs) jasonhartman.com. So there you go. What are the tax implications, if any, on a loan modification? What should people be considering here, Diane? Well, it, it depends on the type of property they've got. For example, the loan modification on a principal residence isn't going to have any federal tax implications at all. That, uh, the debt forgiveness, we've got forgiveness on that. For California, we'd have that. If you've got an investment property, there can be some tax consequences on that. This could come, come in as cancellation of debt, and it's offset then by some basis adjustment, but you don't have a sale to create a loss possibly. This is where you need to get out your thinking cap and figure out how to avoid tax issues on that. Okay, but we have to make the distinction. I think the type of loan modification you're referring to there, Diane, is where they actually reduce the principal balance of the loan, right? Yes, yeah, okay. well, that's the kind we're talking about. Exactly, right, that so I they, about. they might modify a loan and they might just make it zero interest for the first five years. They did that on one of mine, which I couldn't believe. Or they might make it lower the interest rate. They might do a forbearance on payments. I mean, there are different types of loan modifications. And I guess none of the others I wouldn't think would have any tax implication other than the principal reduction loan modification. Is that correct? That's exactly right. Oh, very good distinction. So if they're lowering your interest rate, if they're saying you can miss a few payments, none of that has a tax consequence. So that's a great strategy. Okay. But if they're lowering your principal, you could have a tax issue. Right. But on the other hand, they're lowering your principal. Well, that's yeah. Too. <laughs> I, I don't mind. Listen, Diane, I'll just admit it to everybody. If I go on a game show and win a million bucks, I don't mind paying taxes on that. That's basically, You're okay with that. Yeah, that's basically what a principal reduction loan modification is. You just won the game show, if you will, and got a big tax consequence. Okay, good. Anything else on the loan modification? You know, I I think, again, like you said, there's so many different possibilities out there. Just be aware of what's going on and what you're doing. Now, you really specialize in your practice in in the real estate field, right? Yeah, real estate and small business. That's, in fact, that's all the only clients we have are small business and estate investors. Do you want to take just a few minutes and talk about anything in the business world? World. A lot of our listeners are home-based entrepreneurs. They own a small business. They might be a, a sort of what we call a solopreneur. Any tax things there that you want to bring up? Well, I, I think there'd be probably three little tips for this year. Number one, if you're in a sole proprietorship, which means it's a Schedule C, 
you have a one in three chance of being audited right now. We're moving everybody we can into business structures of some kind, an LLC, an S Corp, a C Corp, depends on the, the, what is best for them. But the sole proprietorship is just an audit red flag. So be aware of that one. The second one, as we're kind of getting ready for the year end and looking at where, you know, what kind of deals can we write off, what should we be thinking about, a lot of times people start thinking about buying some equipment, new computers, printers, that type of thing. For 2009, we actually have three different ways that you can take advantage of depreciation, which when you're buying furniture and equipment, you don't get an immediate write-off. You have to capitalize the assets. Uh, number one, we've got Section 179 which is, lets you have the immediate write-off, you can take up to $250,000 off this year. It's a huge number. That's a lot of computers. So the IRS wants people to buy capital equipment for their business. That's what they're incentivizing, right? Exactly. They're trying to get the economy kick-started. Right. And so they want to help you do that, make that choice. Well, Section 179, one little piece in here, and this is going to lead into the third awesome thing that they've done for us, but it, Section 179 can't take you to a net operating loss. In other words, you can use a Section 179 to the point that it takes you to zero. Number two, you can have instead bonus depreciation. Bonus depreciation is you get to take a write-off of 50% of whatever you've paid right off the top and then do your regular depreciation. So this could be a, a really cool thing because it can take you into a net operating loss. One part here, in order to get bonus depreciation, it has to be brand new. Now, just to wrap up with the third reason that I really like the net operating loss and why I'm mentioning that, in 2009, we have the ability to take the loss back five years. Now, this could be pretty huge. If people have had businesses that are maybe not doing as well right now in this economy, but maybe five years ago, they had some banner years and were paying a lot of taxes can take that net operating loss, carry it back to those good years, and get a refund, the IRS is supposed to pay you within 45 days that refund. If they don't, they're going to pay you interest. Wow, the IRS is going to pay us interest for a change? Yeah. <laughs> I <love it. laughs> and I have to tell you, I told this to a client, 2008 we had the same rule, uh, the, this five-year window. He was a guy who had made a ton of money five years before and had a big loss in 2008. We took it back five years getting a refund of $200,000. And I said, well, the IRS is going to pay you within 45 days or they're going to pay you interest. He didn't believe me. He got his check within 45 days. Wow. What a difference that made. Sure, sure it did. Now, what's the benefit here? Was the prior rule, Diane, was it two years carry back? It was. It was two years. And now it's five, so there's more years. Okay. Yeah, so it's five years. And what's happened is, is that if it was only two years for this year, you'd be looking at 2007, 2008. And for a lot of businesses, those have been tough years. They don't have huge wins in those years. So going back five years, that's back to the banner years. They've right. got more income then. Right. That's, so that's really good news. That's great. I'm sure a lot of our listeners just love what you said, including myself. I, I'm thinking I might have a deduction with one of my companies on there because I have a few different corporations. So when did that go into effect in 08? That was passed. Oh, gosh, less than two weeks ago. Oh, oh so that's an 09 rule, but that yeah, means... Yeah, 09 rule for 09, yep. Okay, so 09 and before, is that how it works? So for 2009, you can take that back five years. Okay, wow, back to 2004. That's fantastic. Okay, good, good. Okay, what so else? The, you're, the, you're, the strategy you're... right now to be thinking about that, if you've got that, then this would be a great time to really maximize the loss in the company. If you're going to take it back and you're taking it back, say, to 2004, where maybe you were at a higher tax bracket. You can really start playing these brackets. So I had a strategy call with one of my clients this morning, and we talked about really buying a bunch of equipment and taking advantage of this bonus depreciation so we've got a big loss to roll back. That's really good for people to know. Listeners, with my business, I'm constantly doing this in my head. Sometimes I will spend money intentionally like a drunken sailor because I know that I can get a tax benefit out of that and turn that in, into income later, but I want to spend it now because I get the write-off now or I can carry back a write-off like Diane just mentioned. There, there's a lot of things you want to think about because remember the single largest expense in anybody's life is almost always tax. 
So th- this is not a boring subject by any means. There's a, a real big, big upside to be made by being a good tax planner. You know, it's interesting when you were talking about the sending money, and it's not always about, oh, we're going to go buy stuff we don't need. It's just maximizing when does it make sense to buy it. And December often is the time to buy instead of January, sure. simply because you get the write-off now. Right. So you want to bring write-offs forward as quick as possible, time value of money, that kind of that kind of discussion. Diane, anything else in the small business? You know, other than it's just been a, it's an interesting time right now, and we'll have to stay tuned to what see what new laws are coming into place. Okay, fantastic. Well, what else would you like our listeners to know just in wrapping things up here? And give out your website, please. Okay, my website is ustaxaid.com. It's ustaxaid.com. And you'll find uh, I've got a blog there. We've got a forum. We've, there's a lot of interesting, I call them the freebies. You can sign up for free teleseminars and listen to tax and asset protection items that you need to know. Uh, additionally, I have a full-service tax practice. You know, come through U.S. Tax Aid, and you'll see what we do and find out if that would be something of interest. I think in general, though, for 2009, if I were summing up what do I have to say about tax planning for this year, it, it's important to know that you've got the most current information and to stay on top of things. A lot of changes coming, not just from the federal government, but also from states as they get more and more aggressive. And we'll have to watch how sales tax and income tax starts playing into that. You know, Diane, one thing in closing here. I remember reading an article about you a couple of years ago, and it was an article in one of the business magazines, and I believe it was about, yeah, it was about, how the number of millionaires is declining in California, especially in the Bay Area, because people are moving, and I'm going to say moving in quotes because we all know people play that game with where their residency is to some extent, either legitimately or sometimes illegitimately. And I, I, I just give you an example. There's a wealthy area here in Newport Beach where it seems like every other car has a Nevada license plate. And, it, you know, you know these people don't live in Nevada, but, of course, California has very high taxes. Nevada has none. So, And, and, and then all the, all the beautiful yachts in the harbor in Newport Beach are from Oregon. <laughs> you know, and, and there's no sales tax there. So people are always doing this stuff. But is there anything as far as like desirable states or obviously states with no state income tax are very desirable, but anything you want to say there as far as thinking for listeners there? I don't know. I just thought I'd ask. Yeah, you know, I, I think that depending on the kind of business you have, it, it is important to think about where your business needs to locate. For example, I have a lot of website businesses besides the ones I've talked about, I have other sites that are doing things. I, I make money on the side and the Internet. And I'm making sure that I have my nexus, which is that's the connection where is the business located in Nevada, simply because the sales tax in Nevada is it helps Internet companies better than some other states. For example, if you go and you buy a, a download of some product, some states are going to charge you sales tax on that. Nevada happens to be one that does not charge a sales tax on a digital download. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm Lots sure. of new things coming down. Yeah. You know, like the, the federal government's got a printing press in the basement. The states don't. You are their economic stimulus plan. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The states can't print money. They actually have to theoretically balance a budget, which right. California doesn't do a very good job of at all. But, uh, but Yeah, I uh, guess they print out IOUs there, not yeah, dollars. That's, so. that's true. That's true. So get your refund soon before it's an IOU. So that's some good advice you gave people today, and I'm sure a lot of our, our listeners will start thinking about how they can save some money on taxes. I sure learned a lot. So thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciated it. The American Monetary Association is a nonprofit venture funded by the Jason Hartman Foundation, which is dedicated to educating people about the practical effects of monetary policy and government actions on inflation, deflation, and personal freedom. Our goal is to help people prosper in the midst of uncertain economic times. This show is produced by the Jason Hartman Foundation, all rights reserved. For publication rights and media interviews, please visit www.hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate professional if you require individualized advice.
Opinions of guests are their own, and the host is acting on behalf of the Jason Hartman Foundation exclusively.